started here. Um, I'm very pleased um, uh, uh, to have um, uh, our, our witnesses that are here. Um, today's bill, H.R. 4, gives us an important opportunity to revisit important episodes in our country's history. Some incredibly painful, others, some of them in incredibly painful, others more hopeful. To give this bill a proper, if not its fullest context, context, we must remember that in the wake of the Civil War, our Constitution was amended by uh, uh, the addition of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, respectfully. Altogether, these are known as the Reconstruction Amendments. It was these amendments that allowed for the first black members of Congress to take their seats in 1870. It was these amendments that paved the way for black officials to be elected at all levels of government, including the appointment to important federal positions like ambassadorships, treasury agents, U.S. Marshals, and all the like. However, the Reconstruction Amendments did not just result in the election of black citizens um, or to important and powerful posts within our government. These amendments also resulted in a tremendous increase in black voter registration. During this time, roughly from 1865 to 1877, black voter registration rates surpassed white registration rates in Louisiana, South Carolina, and Mississippi. In the 1868 presidential election, over 700,000 black citizens cast their first ever <laughs> uh, ballot. This new America scared many people to their bones, and by 1866, the Ku Klux Klan had been founded and was embarking on a reign of terror against black people, elected and unelected, across the South. By 1877, Reconstruction was abandoned, federal oversight and protection removed, and Jim Crow implemented. The racist and insidious system would remain until those in the civil rights movement, myself included, fought to end this de jure uh, system predicated on racist policy. One of the manifestations of this effort was the 1965 Voting Rights Act. That legislation outlawed tools of oppression like poll taxes and literary, literacy tests, the only purpose of which was to keep black people from exercising the franchise. The Voting Rights Act turned out to be a great success and was uh, so in large part because of its use of a coverage formula and its pre-clearance requirement. Indeed, in a fit of irony, um, uh, Justice Roberts' court would use the Voting Rights Act's own success as the cudgel the court would use to dismantle the act's decades-long usefulness. Chief Justice Roberts, in my view, uh, naive insistence that nearly 50 years later, things have changed dramatically because the devices used to oppress voters of uh, color uh, have been banned, has proven a misguided take on the America we find ourselves living in today. Indeed, after Justice Roberts' court gutted Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, we've seen a growth in attempts to make it more difficult for Americans to access the ballot box. Quite frankly, this burden has disproportionately fallen on the shoulders of people of color. Let me just end here for now. I'm 83 years old, and I'm a native Floridian, and I'm here to tell you I've lived in a pre-clearance situation and was elected in one. And if it had not been for Sections 4 and 5 of the Voting Rights Act, it's very unlikely that Congresswoman Marsha Fudge and I uh, and many of uh, our other colleagues would not be sitting in the United States Congress. African Americans and others have suffered oppression for an extraordinary period of time. We're used to it, and we are unrelenting in making sure that every person in this nation has an opportunity to vote. And rather than obstruct, we should be about the business of instructing people how important voting is not only to their lives, but the fabric of our democracy. 
the Voting Rights Advancement Act will do just that. In addition to taking up H.R. 4 today, we will also complete consideration of H.R.S. 326. I'd like now to turn to our ranking member, Mr. Cole, uh, for any remarks he wishes to make. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Before I make my formal remarks, I want to just say for the record, there's nothing in the history that you recited I disagree with Understood. whatsoever. And uh, I know my friend, uh, uh, Mr. Cohen, as well, and, and uh, uh, you know, we have a difference of opinion about the value of this legislation. We don't have any difference of opinion about the history that has brought us to this point. Today's hearing, Mr. Chairman, is covering H.R. 4, the Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2019. I think all members of this committee would agree that the right to vote is one of the most fundamental rights we have as citizens to our, uh, of our nation. Uh, and given that shared belief, to me personally, it's disappointing that the majority has chosen to bring up what I believe is a partisan bill that appears to be nothing more than another attempt to federalize all elections. As members of this committee know, I've long advocated for the protection of minority voting rights. Because of my own Chickasaw tribal heritage, I'm particularly attuned to protections for Native Americans. In fact, I was proud to co-sponsor in this Congress uh, both uh, H.R. 1799, the Bipartisan Voting Rights Amendment Act of 2019, and H.R. 1694, the Native American Voting Rights Act of 2019. I note with great uh, satisfaction that my colleagues, Mr. Hastings and Ms. Torres, are also co-sponsors of that Native American Voting Rights Act, and I want to thank them personally very much for their strong stand in this area. The bill before us, however, is a real disappointment to me personally. With only 12 legislative days remaining this year, and with pressing items still outstanding, there's simply no need to bring up a partisan bill to fill the time. We would have been far better off, in my opinion, to bring up H.R. 1799, the bipartisan version of the reforms to the Voting Rights Act, which addresses the Supreme Court's holding in the Shelby County versus Holder uh, and revises the criteria for determining which states are subject to the Voting Rights Act without also being a complete federal takeover of state and local elections. As a former Secretary of State uh, of Oklahoma, I'm very familiar with how important it is for states to oversee and operate their own elections, as they have done historically. The bill before us includes provisions that would force all states, not just those subject to, to the coverage formula, to subject uh, certain election procedures to review by the federal government. This is an unprecedented power grab, in my opinion, by Washington that would completely change the character of elections as we know them. Uh, I'm also deeply concerned uh, with the proposed coverage formula included in H.R. 4. The coverage formula proposed here runs the risk of being over-inclusive and forcing more and more states into the pre-clearance procedures required by the Voting Rights Act. We need to take uh, a more measured approach, in my opinion and balance the need to protect voting rights, particularly minority voting rights, with the fact that states have always operated their own elections as they see fit. Mr. Chairman, we had a chance here to bring up a bipartisan bill to solve these problems. I believe that a bipartisan bill to reform the Voting Rights Act and to address the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby versus Holder would have uh, passed with an overwhelming bipartisan majority. Instead, we are considering yet another non-starter bill with no chance of passing the Senate and no chance of becoming law. That means uh, we're yet again wasting time and missing opportunities to actually legislate in a bipartisan and meaningful way. Uh, I hope Mr. Chairman uh, will stop missing these opportunities. I look forward to hearing uh, from our witnesses. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The ranking member, Mr. Cole, yields back, and I thank him for his opening. Let me um, compliment uh, our witnesses uh, who, who are here. I'd like to welcome them uh, from the Judiciary Committee uh, to provide testimony on H.R. 4, the Voting Rights uh, uh, Advancement Act of uh, 2019, and to compliment both of you, Mr. Raskin and Ms. Lesko, recognizing that you all have uh, had an extraordinary day. Uh, we really do uh, uh, thank you uh, for uh, your efforts uh, and your being here. Uh, we are delighted you're here, and anything you brought in writing uh, will, without objection, be entered into the record. And let's begin with Mr. Cohen. 
Is your mic on? Especially on this important, well, I'll start over, I guess. Chairman Hastings and Ranking Member Cole, it's, it's an honor to be with you, especially on this uh, historic and important legislation, the Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2019. It's a, this is a comprehensive and much needed proposal to amend the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to restore that core civil rights statute to its full vitality. The bill's response to the Supreme Court's disastrous 2013 decision in Shelby County versus Holder, which effectively gutted the act's most important and powerful enforcement mechanism, its preclearance requirement contained in Section 5, by striking, striking down the coverage formula that determined which jurisdictions would be subject to preclearance. The court, mistakenly in my view, considered Section 5 an unjustified intrusion into state sovereignty. The majority, however, expressly said that Congress could, quote, draft another formula based on current conditions, unquote, <laughs> and that, among other things, is exactly what H.R. 4 does. Specifically, H.R. 4's coverage formula provides that looking back 25 years, states in which 15 or more voting rights violations have occurred are those in which 10 or more violations have occurred if at least one of the violations was committed by the state itself would be subject to preclearance. Localities that have committed three or more violations within that 25-year look-back period would also be subject to preclearance. H.R. 4 also strengthens other related provisions of the Voting Rights Act. The bill would, one, expand the availability of bail-in coverage so that a court can impose preclearance in a particular jurisdiction that has violated the 14th or 15th Amendments, the Voting Rights Act, or any other federal anti-voting discrimination law. Secondly, it expands the Attorney General's authority to send federal election observers. It also requires states and localities to provide critical public notice and enhance transparency of voting changes and practices when they are implemented. And it amends the Act's injunctive relief provision to allow private parties to seek such relief and to make it easier for them to obtain preliminary injunctions. It also adds practice-based preclearance formula that would subject any jurisdiction that engages in certain practices that have historically been used to discriminate against minority voters, like changing methods of election or jurisdictional boundaries or imposing voter identification requirements, and in most instances meets certain demographic thresholds. This last provision, the practice-based preclearance formula, is the subject of my manager's amendment or Mr. Nadler's manager's amendment, in fact. Through the leadership of my colleague, Representative Marsha Fudge, the Committee on House Administration's Subcommittee on Elections conducted an extensive review of the landscape of voting in America post Shelby County and examined the current barriers to voting across the country. In November, after the Judiciary Committee's markup of H.R. 4, the Subcommittee on Elections published its report on voting rights and elections administration, which buttressed the record already compiled by the committee, the full committee. The Subcommittee on Elections found an array of tactics in place used to suppress the votes of targeted communities and barriers that impede the free exercise of the right to vote. Specifically, the Subcommittee of Elections found persistent discrimination in voting law changes such as the purging of voter registration rolls, cutbacks to early voting, and polling place closures and relocations. All these issues were not specifically addressed in the reported version of H.R. 4, but they are the focus of the manager's amendment. The manager's amendment would address the issues raised by the election subcommittee report by one, expanding the known practices provision to include changes that reduce the days or hours of in-person voting on Sundays during an early voting period, and two, adding an additional covered practice to include new procedures for voter purges where a jurisdiction includes racial or language minority populations above a certain percent threshold. This amendment makes an already strong bill even more comprehensive in its response to the record of discrimination compiled throughout the oversight process of three House committees. Having heard oral testimony from approximately 120 witnesses and established a substantial record documenting an ongoing and disturbing pattern of voting discrimination by jurisdictions around the country since the Shelby County decision. The record demonstrates that states and localities, particularly those that were formerly subject to the preclearance requirement, have enacted or engaged in an ongoing series of voter suppression tactics having a disproportionate and negative impact on racial and language minority voters. As we consider this record and the need for H.R. 4, it is well worth remembering why it was the Congress that put a preclearance requirement in the Voting Rights Act in the first place. Before the Act, many states and localities implemented voter suppression measures aimed at African Americans and other people of color, secure in the knowledge that it could take many years before these measures could be successfully challenged in court, if at all. As soon as a court, after years of litigation, overturned one law, the offending jurisdiction would enact another law to replace it. 
This meant that black voters could be shut out of polling places even if they succeeded in every lawsuit against a discriminatory voting law or practice because a new one would already be in place to keep them from the ballot box. In response to this discriminatory game of whack-a-mole, Congress required certain jurisdictions with a history of racial discrimination and voting to get approval from the Justice Department or from a federal court before making any changes to their voting laws or practices. Congress intended this preclearance requirement to address with the Supreme Court an called an unremitting and ingenious def defiance of the Constitution by states determined to suppress minority votes. In essence, the horse was out of the barn, and by the time you could get some kind of jurisdictional uh, relief in courts, the election had taken place and the discriminatory act had, had, had affected the election. Despite the success of the Voting Rights Act in dramatically increasing American voter registration and the number of African Americans holding elected office, problems remained decades later. As the Constitution Subcommittee, which I chair, uh, uh, we learned in 2006 as part of the uh, process of reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act, there continued to be substantial and ongoing voter discrimination. This was made clear after the subcommittee heard from dozens of witnesses and considered thousands of pages of evidence. Notwithstanding this exhaustive record compiled by Congress, the court in Shelby County essentially decided to substitute its own judgment for that of Congress. Not surprisingly, the Shelby County decision unleashed a deluge of voter suppression laws across the nation, included in many states and other jurisdictions that have been subject to preclearance before Shelby County. For instance, within 24 hours, Texas and North Carolina moved to reinstate draconian voter <coughs> ID laws. Within 24 hours, while courts later held both of these laws to be intentionally racially discriminatory, during the years between their enactment and the court's final decisions, these states held many elections while the discriminatory laws remained in place, horse out of the barn. Another particular troubling aspect of the court's reasoning in Shelby County was its emphasis on the supposed equal sovereignty of the states and on states' authorities to administer elections, even when they have abused that authority by denying the right to vote. The court's reasoning barely acknowledged that the constitutional amendments enacted after the Civil War during Reconstruction were intended fundamentally to reorder Congress's relationship to the states and to give Congress the power to supersede state sovereignty when needed to enforce the, the mandates of these amendments. Indeed, the Supreme Court has held that Congress's authority to enforce the 15th Amendment's prohibition against racial discrimination by states in voting means that Congress, quote, may use any rational means, unquote, to make laws against racial discrimination in voting. Notwithstanding the Shelby County decision, the court has thus far left this highly deferential rationality test in place. In short, Congress has the power and indeed the obligation to reverse this tide of voter suppression laws. The 14th and 15th Amendments expressly empower us to enact laws protecting the right to vote and guaranteeing the equal protection of all citizens. And although the Shelby County decision did great damage to the Voting Rights Act, the court made clear that it was not striking down preclearance altogether. As the Voting Rights Act is the crown jewel of our civil rights laws, we can no longer afford its delay, uh, to, afford to delay its restoration to full vitality. I ask the members of this committee to join me in that effort, an effort which one of our colleagues, John Lewis, famously uh, was beaten in, in marching in, over the Pettus Bridge. And Mr. Hastings was part of that movement. Many great civil rights leaders participated in seeing the, the civil disobedience result in an action by the Congress and the President of the United States in getting the Voting Rights Act passed. I strongly encourage members of this committee to adopt the manager's amendment, and a rule that affects the importance and extreme sensitivity of opening one of the nation's most critical civil rights statutes for amendment. This reauthorization legislation has resulted in an extensive process that included 18 hearings before three different House committees, Judiciary, Oversight, and House Administration. It is our belief, as well as the belief of most of my Judiciary Democratic colleagues, that this carefully crafted legislation should not be amended after floor consideration to reflect this careful multi-committee process. I thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions, and uh, am in awe of being in front of you, Mr. Hastings, on this legislation, and well, it's important, the work that you've done over the years. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cohen. Uh, now recognize the distinguished gentleman uh, from Arizona, Mr. Biggs. Thank you, Chairman Hastings. It's a pleasure to be with you and your committee. Thank you, Ranking Member Cole and members of the committee. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify today about discrimination in federal elections. Discriminatory treatment in voting based on race or sex is abhorrent. It's prohibited by the Constitution as it should be. It's prohibited by federal statute as it should be. But too often, complaints of discrimination in voting have nothing to do with discriminatory treatment. Instead, rules entirely neutral on their face are sometimes claimed to be discriminatory simply because they have a disparate impact on one group or another. But disparate impacts are not always proof of discrimination. 
Moving a polling location, for, for instance, from point A to point B, for, for example, may well mean that one demographic group or another will have to travel one more block to get to the polling place than another demographic group. But that doesn't always mean that moving the polling location one block this way or that is imbued with discriminatory motivation. However, HR 4 would subject states to control of the Justice Department, an entity with a history of politicizing that power in the past. And it would do so based on claims of disparate impact, which are statistically inevitable and not necessarily evidence of any racially discriminatory treatment. As witnesses at the hearings on this bill have explained, Congress cannot constitutionally enact legislation denying states and localities control over their voting rules when there's no evidence that they've been engaging in discriminatory treatment in voting based on race. The Supreme Court's holding in City of Bourne versus Flores held that a law enacted pursuant to the 14th Amendment must be congruent and proportional to actual constitutional violations that can be established in an evidentiary record. In considering whether law satisfies Bourne's congruence and proportionality standard, the court assesses whether a record of actual constitutional violation exists, that is, intentional discrimination in voting based on race. H.R. 4, in direct contradiction of Supreme Court precedent, would require federal control over state and local elections based on absolutely no evidence of racial discrimination in voting. Compounding that constitutional error, H.R. 4 also requires certain types of voting laws to be subject to preclearance automatically, such as legal voter verification laws, not only without any prior showing of discrimination of any kind, but simply by federal fiat. As Professor Morley and others testified, H.R. 4 runs afoul of these constitutional principles because it does not base its remedies on evidence of actual discrimination in voting. As Professor Morley informed the committee, applying the Bourne case, the Supreme Court has struck down several provisions of federal law, including the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993's self-care provisions, Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Violence Against Women Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, the Trademark Remedy Clarification Act, and the Patent and Plant Variety Protection Remedy Clarification Act. If H.R. 4, as presented to us today, is ever enacted into law, it would likely follow this long list of unconstitutional federal statutes struck down by the Supreme Court, and for good reason. H.R. 4 even contains a requirement that certain election laws automatically be subject to preclearance. Found in Section 4A of H.R. 4, this practice-based preclearance would apply everywhere immediately and would automatically cover election law changes such as modifying jurisdictional boundaries, voter qualification laws, including voter ID laws, and changes regarding bilingual ballot procedures, even when there is no evidence that any of these laws are discriminatory. The Supreme Court considers discriminatory treatment and voting a necessary justification for federal intervention in elections. Beyond that, most people properly understand that the purpose of federal voting civil rights laws is to protect people from actual discriminatory treatment in voting, not to provide a politicized Department of Justice with the means of shutting down reasonable state and local election laws in order to further the interest of one political party or another. To rectify just one of the fundamental problems with the bill, Representative Mike Johnson offered an amendment that was a rule of construction, which read as follows, rule of construction. For purposes of this act, any amendment may be, excuse me, any amendment made by this act, a voting rights violation shall consist only of intentional discrimination that occurs on the basis of race, color, or membership in a language minority group. If the purpose of HR 4 is to constitutionally address actual racial discrimination voting, it should say so clearly. The rejection of this amendment by all the Democrats on the House Judiciary Committee shows clearly the purpose of HR 4 is to allow the federal government to control state and local election laws even when no actual discriminatory treatment based on race has occurred. In some, H.R. 4 unconstitutionally creates a system in which a politicized Department of Justice can federalize control over state and local elections when there is no evidence of state or locality engaged in actual discriminatory conduct. Further, existing law already protects Americans from voting discrimination. Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act allows lawsuits, even those based on disparate impacts, to stop state and local voting laws, including through preliminary injunctions. And Section 3 of the Voting Rights Act allows federal judges across the country to put jurisdictions under preclearance requirements when those jurisdictions have a record of actual discrimination in voting. Mr. Chairman, thank you today for the opportunity to testify. I appreciate the time and consideration of the committee. Thank you uh, so very much. I do have uh, just a, a few questions, and I'll direct uh, myself to uh, Mr. Cohen. Uh, 
I did hear you say that there were a number of uh, hearings on this particular matter. Uh, will you repeat uh, uh, for I, us? I believe there were 18. I know my subcommittee in, in Judiciary, Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties had at least, would we have six or seven? Eight? Eight. That's getting there. That's getting there. All Moving right. up the ladder. Hey. And am I correct that um, the, the uh, subcommittee that Ms. Fudge or the direction uh, that Ms. Fudge was on held hearings around the United States? Do you remember how many they were? I remember nine. Nine? All right. <laughs> and one of those was in my congressional uh, district. Did you participate in any of them? Uh, I was in Houston, Texas. We had one in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, and then the, the others that uh, the committee had were, were... Well, I'm I'm not going to belabor it by asking uh, either of you questions, but Mr. Biggs, uh, well, at the beginning of the year, offline, I'm going to have a conversation with you about the county that I represent. I represent Broward and Palm Beach County, the butterfly ballot and the hanging chair. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, and the place where uh, the registration books were taken home uh, uh, by people to uh, 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 doctor things. So, uh, and there's a recent example that I won't go into now, but I will talk with you about it so I can demonstrably show you right in my area there is continuing discrimination. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to that conversation. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Torres. Um, thank you both for um, being here. Um, obviously, you know, for me, um, as a naturalized citizen, uh, I think that one of the most important um, things that we can do is to protect and ensure that people um, have um, the best chance that they possibly have to be able to cast their vote on election day. Um, not just in national elections, but local elections. You know, as a local um, city councilwoman, former city councilwoman, elected mayor, I, mean, I think that those um, elections are just as important as any other election <laughs> because they touch the people. They're at the closest um, place with the people. You're familiar with the incident that occurred in Dodge City in the last presidential election, Kansas? Dodge City is nowhere near California. But why do I know about um, this incident? It's because a Latino community had been oppressed. A polling location, um, a single polling location for 13,000 registered voters had been moved, not by a single block, but two and a half miles to a place where there was no direct public transportation. And it was specifically targeted to prevent the poor working class um, Latinos from voting. Um, as it turns out, that city doesn't have a, a single minority on its local board, still doesn't. So when I see a bill like this coming forward to ensure that we opt on the side of the voter and that we work together towards achieving the highest goal that we can possibly achieve, and that is to get you know, people that are registered to vote, that qualify to be registered to vote, to the polling locations and to vote. I mean, in countries like the country where I was born, you know, people die for the right to vote, to be able to exercise the right. Unless you know a narco trafficker that can finance your campaign or you know, a very corrupt um, official, you're not going to be able to participate in an election and run for office as freely as we have here um, in the US. So for those reasons, um, I want to thank you for bringing the bill forward. Um, I'm looking forward to voting for this on the floor. I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation with our communities to ensure that we practice what we preach, and that is that our goal is to get the population to the polls and to exercise their right. So thank you, and I yield back. 
All right. I now turn to the ranking member for any questions he may have. Mr. Cole. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me start with my good friend, Mr. Cohen. Uh, Mr. Cohen, did you seek uh, any input from the National Association of Secretaries of State before drafting the legislation that would literally affect the duties of every Secretary of State, every chief election official in the country? In the initial drafting of the legislation, they were consulted. Well, that's not what they told me. Uh, and uh, just for the record, I want to submit a letter from the National Association of Secretaries of State, not to that point, to be fair, but uh, simply one that says that uh, they lay out, they would, they would ask to always be consulted in any legislation that affects their duties. Uh, and they have a very extensive set of conditions here that they would like us to meet, which I'm not convinced this legislation does. But if I may, I would just submit the letter for With the your unanimous consent, without objection. Very, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Biggs, let me, I have a series of questions for you. Uh, let me start with, is the Voting Rights Act the permanent law and, and it doesn't expire? Is that true? That's my understanding. Um, Mr. Cole, that's my understanding. Okay. That's my understanding as well. Uh, does the current law protect Americans from voter discrimination? It's my understanding that it does. I believe it does. I think it does as well. Does the current law allow private individuals to file suit against discriminatory laws? It does, sir. And does the current law allow the Department of Justice to file suit against any discriminatory laws? It does, sir. Uh, given those facts, I, I, I'm a little con confused. The majority would have us believe that the Voting Rights Act does not provide these protections already, but there are, they are, in fact, the given law of the land, and that does not expire. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Section 2 and Section 3. Okay. Uh, the ranking member of House Administration, whose committee has uh, been looking into voting and election issues, has told me that throughout the seven field hearings, not one witness has claimed they were prevented from casting their vote. And that leaves us to question, Mr. Chairman, why then is the majority bringing this bill before us? It looks to me like it's uh, politically motivated. And the risk here is real, that you will federalize uh, you know, state and local elections. And, I, you know, I would just argue that's very much against uh, uh, the way our federal system has been intended to operate from the beginning. I have no, dis no problem if there's discrimination or inappropriate activity with the federal government uh, taking action. Quite the opposite. You know, I've supported legislation which gives us the ability to do that. But, uh, again, uh, you know, I... <laughs> I think, and Mr. Biggs, I'd ask you, you know, am I stating the position correctly that the existing law provides these kind of protections? Yes, sir. I believe it does provide those kind of uh, protections. I think they're in place. And um, if, if there's a, even a movement of a polling place, um, it's subject to fe it can be subject to federal review and private cause of action. Last question, Mr. Biggs. The Supreme Court held that f federal control over local elections is allowed only when there's proof of discriminatory treatment in voting. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. This bill allows, for, just for the record, the federal takeover of state and local elections without having any evidence to support those claims. Wouldn't it stand a reason that the bill itself, you know, might be considered unconstitutional? I think it's a, I think it's a lawsuit waiting to happen, sir. Okay, well, those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much, Ms. Cole. Mr. Perma. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and just want to thank the gentleman. I mean, I think the bottom line here is we'd love for discrimination to be a thing of the past. It's not. Uh, there may be things in the law that exist today, but I think the bill that Mr. Cohen brings us uh, today really bolsters our um, armor in terms of defending against discrimination and making sure that people can exercise their right to vote, which is just key to everything we do around here and certainly uh, to the, uh, directing this country in the future. So I just appreciate your bringing the bill. Your comments, Mr. Biggs, I, I thank you for those, but I certainly think this uh, bill is uh, absolutely necessary, and I'm going to support it. Thanks, Mr. Cohen. Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I come from a part of the country, as Mr. Cohen does, uh, that uh, was in Section uh, 5 uh, for uh, abhorrent behavior that uh, was outlawed before the time of my birth. I appreciate uh, what uh, the bill before us does. Uh, 
in that it says we're not going to hold you responsible for what your forefathers uh, did. We're going to hold everybody to the same uh, to the same standard. And for that, I I'm grateful that, that we're no longer going to single out the South as as being a part that can't be trusted. The city of Atlanta required uh, pre-clearance, but the city of Chicago uh, was uh, deemed to be uh, uh, without uh, flaw. And I, I found that uh, uh, troubling uh, as, a, as a federal legislator. But I am, uh, having listened to, to both of your uh, testimonies as they were broadcast, I am concerned about a point Mr. Biggs uh, raised. I, I do support a single standard uh, for the nation. Uh, but why have we chosen for that standard to be that the federal government uh, must pre-clear everything in the delineated circumstances, as opposed to if there's a, a finding of discrimination anywhere that the federal government uh, may then, uh, then get involved? As I understood your testimony, uh, Mr. Cohen, uh, if, if my jurisdiction decides to expand the days of early voting, uh, and does not uh, get a higher voter turnout as a result, and then d decides they want to reduce uh, those, uh, those days uh, 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 to save taxpayer dollars, that that decision, simply because it falls into the category of reducing the number of days of early voting, now has to go to the Justice Department for approval. Did I, did I understand the standard properly? Yes, sir. Uh, those are areas in which there's been historic discrimination. And uh, if you go back to the history, Mr. Woodall, and first, Tennessee was not in preclearance. We probably should have been, and we've done some terrible things. You but clearly had better legislators than, uh, than we did. Uh, as we got, uh, got in, I'm going to have to go back and look at Well, uh, I was one of them uh, for 24 years, so thank you. I don't know. But, the, 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 you know, the history of this is the Civil War. And, I mean, states' rights, I understand states' rights, and I understand people believe in states' rights, and we should, in certain areas we should have states' rights. Uh, Legalization of marijuana is a place where we should have states' rights. The states should decide that like they do alcohol. But in terms of discrimination, the states were pretty bad. They seceded from the nation so we wouldn't lose the institution of slavery. This was back, and that in, was the, back in 19, 18, 1861. 1800s is when that And a lot of that stuff hadn't changed. Uh, slavery turned into Jim Crow. Jim Crow turned into sharecropping. And all of that turned into people wanting to maintain their power. The Klan did acts and influenced legislation to where many African Americans left the South and moved to the North because they were afraid to live there because that's what the Klan wanted. And we finally got uh, Brown versus Board of Education in the 1950s. Uh, didn't get around to real help with that till the 60s. It took a while for it to, to come around because the states resisted it. Uh, we had the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And that worked for a long time. And it was on the books and it was passed, uh, the re reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, almost unanimously. And I, I don't know, was it 2006? When was the year? 2006, 2006. It, had only, it maybe only had 20 people vote against it in, in the entire Congress. And then, then we came up for another reauthorization, and uh, the, 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 the politics have changed. But because the politics changed, there was. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that we struck down preclearance, and we've got this situation. Section 2 exists, but Section 2 is very expensive, and Section 2 cannot effectively police uh, discriminatory practices before the election's taken place and the harm has occurred. That's why you need preclearance. So we came up with a new formula that wasn't based on the old states. Most of them were states from the South. Old times there are not forgotten. They certainly weren't. And there was also Arizona was part of it. There were a few jurisdictions in New York and a few other places in the country. But mostly it was the going around the, 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 the southern band. It was Arizona. It was Texas, I think, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. Florida, Florida. get in there, too? Florida. And, went up, and it went up the coast, just like a hurricane. Right. Just take that Sharpie and draw that little map over there. And, uh, and it got up to, I think, it didn't get to Virginia quite, but it came close. And, and they just... Uh, you know, they still have the highest number of voting. So these areas which we've delineated are places where the, the states had jumped into action, and the effect was the uh, disparate impact was on minorities. Uh, in Texas, a lot of the information we heard was from language minorities, but it was often most directly at African Americans. 
and to keep their voting strength down. So that's why we, the, the, the bill suggests that you should have it on those cir circumstances. And yeah, I understand Mr. Mr. Cole is a very difficult person for me to, to speak against because he's, he's just a, he's a star, uh, not just on your side, but he's a star in Congress. But uh, the fact is there's nothing more important than voting rights. And you, I don't think you can do enough to give people the right to vote. That's what America is based upon. That's what the Constitution is based upon. There, it's giving everybody a right to participate and having an, an election and elections that are free and fair and everybody participates. And so, if you have preclearance pre and you know that the states have been discriminatory and certain areas have been discriminatory, it seems like you ought to bend over a little backwards to let the federal government come in, especially in the civil with the civil rights and the Reconstruction statutes, where we've got a duty and an obligation that goes back 170 years. To, to do right after we did wrong for 250 years, or give or take, slavery. And then all those Jim Crow years weren't real fine. We've not found preclearance in Georgia to have quite that same positive uh, effect. Uh, we got our maps pre-cleared in the 1990s, only to have the courts throw them out uh, two years uh, later. Uh, going to the, to the Justice Department uh, does, not, uh, does not solve that problem, which was Mr. Biggs' testimony. If you have evidence of, of discrimination, we want to litigate that, and that, that's my well, question. Stacey Abram was one of our witnesses, and she told us about a lot of instances that were troubling. The, uh, Recently, the, recent the, urging. I'm, I'm familiar with, uh, uh, with Ms. Abram's testimony. She also uh, created the largest voter turnout uh, machine uh, the state of Georgia has seen uh, in my uh, lifetime. Absolutely amazing. Uh, more minority voting uh, this past uh, cycle than we've ever ever seen before. I'm a Republican. I represent a majority-minority uh, district, uh, and we have seen voting rise uh, in each and every uh, each and every cycle. But my question is, because I, I listened to your testimony, listened to Mr. Biggs' testimony, uh, I listened to your responses to Mr. Cole's questions. These are not issues that divide us. When you talk about ending discrimination, those are issues that, that unite us. When you talk about guaranteeing an individual's right to vote, those are issues that, that unite us. When you talk about using federal power to curb known state abuses, uh, those are issues that, that unite us. Why is it, uh, given that backdrop, given the near unanimous vote that you point out in the last reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, why is it that the committee couldn't couldn't find a, a bipartisan pathway forward. My understanding was there were some, some options, and, and understand that this is not a particularly bipartisan time on the Judiciary Committee, and maybe it's the, it's the timing that's, uh, that's wrong. But I, 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 I am frustrated that something uh, that should be a uniting uh, issue uh, has all the uh, telltale signs of becoming a a, a, a talking point as opposed to a, to a piece of legislation that goes to the president's desk. Let me submit this to you, Mr. Woodall. When I, th I don't remember the year. It could have been 2011. It could have been 2012. I do know it was after that jet crashed somewhere down there near the South Pole, they think, or you know, they didn't know where they ever found it. Uh, we had a Voting Rights Extension Act to come up, and uh, we used that formula that I hate to say you couldn't get a sp sponsor you couldn't be a sponsor of the bill unless you had somebody from the other side. So I wanted to be a sponsor. So I went and, and I looked around on my, for my Republican friends and colleagues and people I've thought the world of and traveled with and thought, and I tried to find a sponsor so I could be a sponsor of the legislation. And it would have been easier for me, and this was 2011 or 2012 before this cultural divide that apparently occurred that exists now. It would have been easier for me to find that airplane than to find another Republican sponsor, and we had six, and we couldn't, I couldn't find a seventh. And, I, and I, I searched on that Republican side, and I asked I, at least 25 people, and I couldn't find others. And that was, that was without all these things that are in here now about uh, changing voting locations, that was just having a new coverage formula. So something happened that's not just this section that quote unquote federalizes all these elections for these types of, of uh, actions that have been shown to be uh, discriminatory against to have a disparate impact on African Americans, I couldn't find a Republican to help me. Well, I, I guess I would I would cite uh, that, and which is why I appreciate the list of questions Mr. Cole uh, uh, asked. We are the business of of uh, of, of voting rights uh, uh, in this uh, in this country and in this institution. To suggest that because there was language uh, that you supported uh, that Republicans did not support does not suggest that there's not broad bipartisan support well, let me for, for anti-discrimination language. I, I failed to, to recall. It was 2013, and it was Sensenbrenner's bill. Mm. And yet there were like six or seven or 
Republican sponsors. And, and I tell you, it would have been easier finding that airplane. I remember having a conversation those times, why it was we were continuing uh, to be singled out uh, in uh, Georgia, why we were not going to receive credit uh, for a uh, decade upon decade in my lifetime of advances and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and support. There's a, there's a, there, there, that was not an unthoughtful decision that uh, folks were making in that, in that time. But Mr. Biggs, you serve on the, on the committee. Is, is, this, uh, is, is this your expectation, too, that if, if folks sat down and rolled up their sleeves, there is no possibility of, uh, of I, mean, I would argue, the law already prohibits discrimination, so I don't know how you're going to make it double secret uh, prohibited. Uh, but is there, is there no prospect uh, for achieving some of the goals that Mr. Cohen uh, desires without uh, a, a federal takeover of, of, of uh, state-run elections? Well, um, I can't predict whether we could sit down and come to a conclusion, but we could certainly continue a discussion. But I will just say that Arizona has been, uh, probably since before my birth, um, you know, we, we have been a preclearance state. And, uh, and quite frankly, um, our, our, our discrimination was, ba was on language discrimination to, to Latinos. And um, our problem had largely, we, we thought we'd made incredible strides. The number of uh, actual and, uh, discriminatory claims had, had really, really dried up in Arizona, but we could never get off a of preclearance in Arizona, no matter what progress we made. And so the, the prospect of going back on a preclearance on everything uh, you do with regard to elections, so when you, you brought up the early ballot situation, we've had, we've had polling consolidation um, uh, conducted by our, our, our Hispanic uh, County um, recorder who's designated uh, locations, he would have to come back to the federal government then and what would otherwise, and it quite frankly, appear to be beneficial to uh, the, the community he's trying to serve, which was, was the, those who had been disadvantaged, uh, uh, dis, disadvantaged uh, Latinos. So uh, I would hope that, that you know, we could continue discussion, but when in reality, I think the persistent uh, Voting Rights Act uh, clauses left after the Supreme Court ruling, I think, provide remedies uh, available for actual discrimination. Your first sentence in your testimony uh, captured uh, it. Uh, the, we are talking about abhorrent yes. uh, 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 behaviors that, uh, that to a man and woman uh, in this institution uh, are, are opposed. And I, I regret that uh, uh, this has the markings of something that, again, will appear to divide us instead of unite us. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Woodall. Uh, Mr. Raskin. Mr. Chairman, thank you. The, the hearings that Judiciary had, that the House Committee Administration had, demonstrate that we are living in a time of continuing and, in some sense, escalating attacks on voting rights uh, and political democracy. We've seen um, increased voter suppression, um, voter purges, uh, cyber attacks and cyber sabotage against political parties and state boards of election, what um, Special Counsel Mueller called a sweeping and systematic attack on the presidential election in 2016 by a foreign power, and so on. And this is nothing new. I mean, nothing has been more passionately felt in American history than the right of all the people to vote and to participate, but nothing has been more heavily or bitterly or violently contested than the right of people actually to go vote and actually to go and participate. Now, the and, and we know the history there, um, and again, there are... Uh, many members of this panel and the various committees who come from states where they know well the history of the disenfranchisement, the grandfather test, the literacy test, the, the poll taxes, um, and so on. Um, the Supreme Court in the 5-4 to four Shelby County versus Holder decision in 2013 cut the heart out of the Voting Rights Act by dismembering the pre-coverage formula. And... Um, Everyone understands why knocking out Section 5 was so lethal to the Voting Rights Act. If someone engages in a discriminatory practice in an election, if you don't have Section 5, sure, you can go sue them when it's all over under Section 2, but all of the damage has been done and the election's been done. And that's what we've been seeing ever since Shelby County versus Holder took place. We've 
seen a lot of elections where people have won Section 2 cases afterwards, but it's basically meaningless because they weren't able to stop it. The beauty of Section 5 was it said, <clears throat> if you want to tamper with the electoral system before an election, you've got to submit it first to the Department of Justice or to a federal district court. And so therefore, you can catch uh, the, um, the bad actors, and you can also deter a lot of people who know that they will be um, they will be detected eventually. Now, I'm delighted to hear Congressman Woodall say that the Voting Rights Act commitment um, is a bipartisan one, and historically it has been a bipartisan one. If you go back and look at the 1965 Voting Rights Act, you look at the 1982 reauthorization, you look at the subsequent reauthorizations, it has been very bipartisan. Um, <clears throat> and that has been important to it. It's a bipartisan statement that we all believe in the right to vote, and we believe that putting up racial obstacles to people's voting rights is really an unforgivable interference with democracy in America. So that's why I am shocked to have heard in judiciary, and I'm shocked to hear again today this eerie language about a federal takeover and states' rights which have a haunting and disturbing resonance in the field of voting rights. I thought that we had a bipartisan commitment that we wanted Congress to be involved. After all, the Constitution gives us under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment the power to implement equal protection and to protect voting rights. The Republican Guarantee Clause compels us to guarantee to the people of all the states a Republican form of government, which means a representative form of government with the right of all the people to vote. So why suddenly do we get this sweeping ideological attack on an attempt to meet the Supreme Court's five to four decision? I don't get that, and I would love it if somebody could explain that to me. Um, <clears throat> the, five, uh, the five justice majority in the Holder decision essentially put us into a straitjacket. And we have to be like Houdini to figure out a, pre, uh, a coverage formula for pre-clearance where we are being responsive to local conditions, which is what all these hearings are about and all the hard work of these committees is about, at the same time that we are not re reverse engineering the statute in order to identify particular states. So we're walking a tightrope. Right? We're trying to thread a needle here. Now, perhaps Mr. Biggs, or I don't know, Mr. Woodall, could tell me, is there an alternative Republican proposal that was advanced? Mr. Biggs, did you have another way to address this problem? I did not introduce additional legislation. But I would just make a comment. Thanks for asking me a question. Yeah. Um, it goes back to Mr. Woodall's question, but the, um, the basically the uh, characterization of of my testimony or anybody else's testimony here is being a radical partisan attack on on this. Oh, did you say radical partisan attack? That, that, I didn't I, say that. that those that, were not that, my words, certainly. That's what I wrote down as you said them. So radical partisan attack? Yeah. I, I would love it if somebody could read it back. I'm certain I didn't use those words. And, and I, I don't see it that way. All I said was I was surprised to hear the language of states' rights and a federal takeover of our elections <laughs> being used for something where there's been a decades-long bipartisan commitment to a strong Voting Rights Act. So, Mr. Mr. Raskin, if you didn't say that, then then my error. But I'm I'm still trying to understand who said re-implementation of states' rights. That was nothing I, that I said in my testimony. Okay. Well, but, but I I have heard the idea of states' rights and federalism, and I, I've certainly heard members of this panel today talk about a federal takeover. I, Mr. Woodall, I thought was quoting you in saying, talking about a federal takeover. I've heard that language used. And I mean, if, if you disavow it, then no, that's I, I thrilling to my ears. I mean. I, I do yeah. think that, that, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I don't. That's all right, I, we'll see. Thank you. Um, I think we're talking about a federal takeover in the terms of interference. For instance, in Arizona, where <clears throat> we've, we've been under preclearance since, as, as long as I know, as long as I know. And regardless of whatever prospects or, or um, progress we've made, we've had to re go back to the federal courts, or excuse me, the feds on everything. And that's part of the problem. And so I don't know what the Republicans have offered, uh, otherwise in the sense that I haven't offered something. But I will say this, um, we, 
in the you talked about the Republican form of government guarantee in the Constitution. That's correct. The capital R, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. We all should have been R. Yeah, no. Th but I think the the purpose of that was to make sure that we did get people to vote. We want people to vote. We do think it's important if if there's some kind of invidious racial discrimination going on. We want to prevent that. We want to stop that. Art uh, Section two and three of the Voting Rights Act provides some relief there. You're not. What I'm hearing is you don't like the relief, you don't think it's enough. I get that, and that's fair, and I think that's a discussion we can continue to have. But, but I don't think that you should uh, use a loaded term which is, has specific meaning when we start talking about racial discrimination such as states' rights. Well, th th thank you very much for your comments. If people have not been using the language of states' rights and federal takeover, I would love nothing more than to hear that the Republicans disavow that because we do have this bipartisan commitment to the Voting Rights Act, which is federal legislation to guarantee that everybody has a right to vote there. And we think that not only is that a proper role for Congress, it's an urgently important role for Congress to play precisely because voting rights have been so besieged and embattled historically in our country. And, you know, I, I so I'm not sure if I can completely divine the meaning of your answer. It seemed to be saying that you don't like a preclearance provision that would conceivably apply to your state. And, and well, no, so, so I'm not sure you were here when I was answering uh, previous questions, yeah. but, but two points. Number one, I do think it is a federal takeover, but I don't think that, that it's, we're talking about a, the loaded term which I conceive of historically of states' rights being used as a, as a um, rationale to justify um, slavery or some other racial discriminatory action 175 years ago. What I'm also want to make sure that you understand, are you with me on that? I well, well, yeah, but nobody has mentioned slavery. No, no, so, but, but yeah. when you use the term states' rights. It, I thought I was quoting, but if, if you disavow the use of states' rights in this context. I did, yes, I, okay. yes. I didn't ever say it's and states' rights. federal sorry. takeover, okay. So I, I did, I did okay. talk about federal takeover or interference in, in, in elections. But the other thing is, it isn't just in Arizona. Um, how do you ever get out of the preclearance that was there prior to Shelby? We never could get out, regardless of the progress we made, regardless of the diminishment of... of, of Despite the bailout provisions? Discriminate, yeah, mm -hmm. that's correct. You okay, never get out. well, I, all, all I guess I would say is, I, I think it's great that you want to continue to discuss it, and I'm happy to discuss it, but we also need action because people's voting rights are under attack today in lots of parts of the country. We need to move forward, and I'd love to work with Mr. Woodall or anybody who thinks that they've got a better way surgically to respond to the Supreme Court decision so we can keep this bipartisan commitment to a national role for protecting the voting rights of the people. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Berger. Thank you, and thanks to our witnesses for being here this evening. Um, try not to prolong this too terribly long, but um, in H.R. 4, there's a formula established to determine the states and jurisdictions subject to preclearance of their voting laws. So under the bill, preclearance is required when there have been 10 or more violations over the previous 25 years, where at least one was committed by the state itself. So do we have a sense that based on this formula, how many states and jurisdictions would currently be affected? I don't think we have a, a, a determination. I don't. I don't know, but of course, this is kind of the Maya Angelou uh, provision of the law. When somebody shows you what they are, believe them. And so when you've got states and localities that have had historical violations, you make them have to come and show that they're doing right when they want to make changes. And it just takes into consideration, there's a formula here, and if you fit into the formula of doing bad in the past, there's a reason to suspect you may be doing bad in the future. Are there states that historically weren't under the preclearance requirement of the Voting Rights Act that may have met this criteria outside of the states and jurisdictions that were covered prior to the Supreme Court decision? Yep. Yeah, there are I some. suspect there were. I mean, I don't know, but I suspect there were. Um, well, I've not been here through 
that many census takings um, with the resulting reapportionment. It's going to happen next year, so we'll all get to see it again. Just as a practical matter, um, it has seemed to me that if in, in Texas, when we have sought preclearance, it doesn't preclude, and the preclearance is given, and the maps are drawn, uh, or the preclearance is given for the maps, and they're enacted, uh, it doesn't preclude the inevitable lawsuits. And in fact, after the 2003 mid-decade redistricting that Texas did, um, we were in court for the rest of the decade uh, over a map that had been pre-cleared by the Department of Justice. So does pre-clearance, all right, good thing, but how, did, how does it help make anything work with greater facility or agility? State goes to the trouble to, state legislature goes to the trouble to say this is what we want to do with our re reapportionment. Justice Department signs off on it, but then inevitably you're in court, in that case, for the rest of the decade. And I think we've been in court all of this decade. Um, and we see it in other states where the Supreme Court has recently said that the current jurisdictional lines have to be redrawn. Seems like in this day and age we could do a better job with that. Do you think what we've got in front of us with this bill is, is going to provide more greater clarity and flexibility and be responsive? I, I think it will, but I tell you what it'll do. It'll get us to the Senate. And if the Senate has a bill and the Senate's the, the states, that's how they're established two per state, that's where the state's rights will come up and the state's issues and state control. They'll pass a bill that'll be different. It'll go to conference. And if we have conference, if everybody's in agreement, as we've said here, that nobody's for discrimination, and the senators think the same way, we'll get a bill. But we gotta get to conference. It'll be in conference, and I'm sure some of the things here that are good, that the Democrats think are good, won't be seen the same way by the Senate, so we'll end up getting a bill that works. But well, this is the first path. You know, I used to be a student of medical irony. Uh, I've branched out, and I see irony on a much grander scale now. And yesterday in this committee, we were talking about how difficult it was to work with the other body and how frequently they were obstructing the good things that, uh, uh, that emanated from the Rules Committee. But I'll take you at your word that the Senate will somehow um, do its job in a timely fashion just going back, do we have any idea how long it takes for a state or jurisdiction to receive preclearance on voting law change? Did that come up in any of the testimony in the hearings that we did? It's always up to the courts. I mean, they have the preclearance. They've got to go to the court and, and show what they're doing is, is not discriminatory. And generally, that doesn't take that long. I thought the preclearance came through the Department of Justice. Either one. Either one. But is it a straightforward and, and, and a process that occurs in a reasonable amount of time? Not always, sir. But, but that, that's kind of been my sense yeah, as my, well. Uh, my experience and, is, it, is it has not always been in a, what we would say a reasonable amount of time. And then I would just say if we're going to engage the Senate, um, I'm not sure sending a what I consider to be a a bill that's constitutionally um, fraught is the best vehicle to get the Senate engaged. All right, well, thank you. It's getting late. I thank both of your testimony, and Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, I'll yield back. Uh, Ms. Gannon? Okay, thank you. These judiciary am... people have a lot of strength. I mean, you know, <laughs> we walk and chew gum. I know, the rest of us are tired for them. Um, well, I am delighted to end the day on this note. Um, because I'm really excited about this bill making its way to the floor. Um, and, and really grateful to our colleague, Terry Sewell, for, for spearheading this effort to make sure that every eligible voter is able to participate in our election process. Um, the original Voting Rights Act in, in 1965 was enacted to address pervaded, pervasive voting, voter discrimination through the use of literacy tests and poll taxes and violence and threats. More than 50 years later, we are seeing a resurgence of some of those tactics along with new modern voter suppression tactics. Um, 
since the 2013 decision in Shelby County versus Holder, some states have been, have actually doubled down on their efforts to enact discriminatory laws that obstruct access to the ballot. Voter purges, voter suppression, and strict voter ID laws that disproportionately affect minorities have become much more widespread since this Shelby decision because it was widely viewed as a license for those who would rather suppress the vote than try to persuade the electorate. For six years, um, this critical uh, portions of enforcement of the Voting Rights Act have not been available. And for the past three years, the Department of Justice has pulled back on actually bringing new voter enforcement actions. So I think the legislation is long overdue, and I look forward to moving it to the floor. Thank you. Ms. Lesko, another one of those judiciary people. I know. We're still going strong here. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I was uh, actually participated in the Phoenix um, hearing uh, recently, just a couple months ago, on the Voting Rights Act. And it was interesting to me that none of the witnesses were election officials. In fact, after the hearing was done, I talked to one of the staff of a Democrat, uh, our Secretary of State, who's a Democrat, and they were really disappointed that they weren't being called as a witness because they don't want this government uh, intrusion, federal government intrusion on every single action uh, they make. They, it really makes like life difficult. Um, and, and so in this Shelby County versus Holder, as we've said before, it struck down section 4B, holding the formula is unconstitutional because the criteria used was outdated, is what they said, and thus violated principles of equal state sovereignty and federalism. And it sounds like from, the, from what my uh, Democratic colleagues are saying here, that HR 4's main purpose is to undo the Supreme Court's decision because you don't like it. And uh, so Mr. Biggs, does that sound like what's happening here? Yeah, I, that's what it sounds like to me. I mean, uh, so you, you, the provisions that are left in the Voting Rights Act actually provide for protection against actual discrimination. And um, as you know, because you're from Arizona too, we've, we have been um, under the thumb of the federal government regardless of how much progress we've made. So you get Secretary Hobbs, Katie Hobbs, who's our Secretary of State, a Democrat. You have our Maricopa County, the largest county in the, in the country, um, uh, five million people as a Democrat, and he doesn't like this. And the reason is, is because they are making strides and they don't want to have to keep going back to the federal government at any time they make um, a change in voting location or expand early ballots because that's the way they are combating discrimination uh, uh, that may have existed in the past. And thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Morell. Ms. Shalala. Uh, just briefly, I come from a state that has a long history of discriminatory voting practices. Um, and this bill is extremely important. We, 65% um, of the people in Florida passed a bill to allow former fe felons to, uh, to vote and the first thing the state legislature did was pass a poll tax to restrict them from voting. Um, this is still going on, and this justifies um, this very important piece of legislation. I strongly support it. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Cohen? I could just add that the, the issue that was addressed by Dr. Burgess, I think, is that generally there's a 60-day clock, and generally the preclearance is... is, is, is determined within 60 days, so it's not that much of a time problem. And the Democrats are not trying to over, you know, comp overturn the, the, the Holder case. The Holder asked the Congress to come up with a new preclearance formula, and that's what we're doing. They didn't, we're not trying to do anything but do what the court asked us to do. All right, thank you all. Uh, does any other Ms. member of the committee wish to ask a yeah. question? Ms. Mr. Yes, Mr. Uh, Chair, I just want to uh, correct a statement I made. Um, my staff told me uh, 
it was the staff member of the Maricopa County Recorder, who is our chief election, who's also a Democrat, that I talked to who said, hey, why, wasn't, why weren't we a witness? So I wanted to correct that instead of the Secretary of State staff. Thank you. Any other member have a question, Mr. Cole? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, submit for the record the uh, statement of administration policy on this issue, which uh, says that the, uh, the president uh, advisors believe that this uh, legislation exceeds the powers granted to Congress and the Constitution, and that if it were to reach his desk, they would advise him to veto the legislation. Because I'm in the chair, I'm going to restrain myself. But <laughs> <laughs> You're always the model of decorum and civility, Mr. Chairman. Received by unanimous consent without objection. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank our witnesses uh, for being here. And as I indicated earlier, if you have anything you would like inserted into the record, you're now dismissed. You, All right, sir. thank you both all so very much. Are there any other members who wish to testify? Seeing none, this closes the hearing portion of uh, our meeting at this time. The chair will entertain a motion from the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. This is a motion for H.R. 4 and H.R.S. 326. I move the committee grant H.R. 4, the Voting Rights Advancement Act, a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on the Judiciary. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on the Judiciary now printed in the bill, modified by the amendment printed in Part A of the report of the Committee on Rules accompanying this resolution shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2 of the rule provides for consideration of HRS 326, expressing the sense of the House of Representatives regarding United States' efforts to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through a negotiated two-state solution under a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the resolution. Finally, the rule provides that the amendments to the resolution and the preamble recommended by the Committee on Foreign Affairs now printed in the resolution, modified by the amendments printed in Part B of the report of the Committee on rules accompanying this resolution shall be considered as adopted and the resolution as amended shall be considered as read. You've heard the motion from the gentleman from Maryland. Is there any amendment or discussion? Yes, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have an amendment to the rule. I would move that the committee uh, provide an open rule for H.R. 4 and uh, uh, H.R. H. Uh, Res. 326. And we don't have a heavy legislative agenda this week. Uh, th this is a matter of great importance. And I will tell you, as a former Secretary of State, I really do think there's a difference between ensuring that everybody have the right to vote and, frankly, reaching the long arm of the federal government into uh, election activities in every state, whether or not there is discrimination that's proved. I think it's very appropriate for us to act when there's discriminatory activity, and, and I've supported legislation to do that in the past. I just think this overreaches. I think we have much better vehicles, and I've, I actually think this is really worthy of a, of a real debate on the House floor. So I would hope that uh, we did not call for any amendments, as I understand it, this particular legislation. Let's give everybody an opportunity. Some people have got some better ideas. There's a way to fix it. Because, I, again, I don't, and I think this point was made by Mr. Woodall and, and several other people, uh, we don't have a difference at all here in terms of wanting to ensure that everybody have the right to vote. I, I think that's an extraordinarily important privilege. And I don't think there's any doubt, uh, you know, or any dispute about the historical reality, there's legitimate concern here. There's a legitimate historical concern. And I, you know, I, I recognize that, and frankly, I value the members of this committee, yourself included, that have been at the forefront of expressing that and defending and expanding that right over the years. So let's, let's have the debate. Let's have a full discussion, see if some better ideas or additional ideas that we haven't covered here or that are, are not in our amendments that are currently submitted come forward. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I would just urge an open rule. Uh, we've heard the uh, request of the uh, gentleman, Mr. Cole. Is there any other discussion? Uh, hearing none. Yes. Uh, hearing. No, okay. Hearing none, the vote is on the gentleman's amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. no.
In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Is there any other Mr. amendment Chairman, or discussion? The gentleman asked for a roll call vote, a uh, recorded vote. The clerk will please call the roll. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Shalala, no. Mr. Desonier. No. Mr. Desonier, no. Mr. McGovern. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko. Aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. The amendment is, the, the clerk will report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Is there any other amendment or discussion? Dr. Burgess. Mr. Chairman, I do have an amendment to the rule, and I move the committee provide for the consideration of H.R. 336, Strengthening America's Security in the Middle East Act of 2019, under an open rule and make the necessary changes to the rule. We heard from our colleague, Representative Zeldin from New York yesterday that H.R. Uh, 336 is identical to S1, which passed in the Senate with a, an overwhelming bipartisan support by a vote of 77 to 23. H.R. 336 provides security assistance to Israel, extends defense cooperation with Jordan, establishes additional <coughs> Syrian sanctions, and allows states to divest from entities that boycott Israel. So few legislative days remain in this session it would seem reasonable to focus on legislation that could be impactful and actually signed into law because it's already passed the Senate. We could do that instead of another messaging bill. This legislation gives us that opportunity. So I ask that we pass the amendment, bring H.R. 336 to the floor, and have a meaningful debate on this important and complex issue. All right, we've heard the amendment uh, from Dr. Burgess. Is there any other discussion? Uh, hearing none, uh, the vote then is on the gentleman's amendment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the no's Mr. have Mr. it. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I thought I heard that the ayes prevailed on that side. <laughs> it may just be my closeness. You, you are a doctor, but you could go to a doctor. <laughs> your well, but I could also ask for a roll call vote, and I'll do that. This, the gentleman asked for a recorded vote. Uh, with that in, in mind, uh, uh, the uh, recorded vote is asked for. The clerk will please call the roll. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. <laughs> Mr. Morelli, no. Ms. Shalala. No. Ms. Shalala, no. Mr. Desonier. No. Mr. Desonier, no. Mr. McGovern. Mr. Cole. Sure, I agree with my friend's vote, but I agree with you about it, Sherry. All right. I'm going to vote aye. All right. <laughs> Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mrs. Lesko, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. The clerk will report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Is there any other amendment or discussion? Um, with that. Um, hearing none, the question is now on the motion offered by the gentleman from Maryland. All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. 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 Uh, they're getting louder. <laughs> <laughs> in the opinion of the chair, in, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion is agreed to. The gentleman has asked for a recorded vote. The clerk will uh, please call the roll. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter, aye. Mr. Raskin, aye. Mr. Raskin, aye. Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Morelli, Mr. Morelli, aye. Ms. Shalala, aye. Ms. Shalala, aye. Mr. Desonier, Mr. Desonier, aye. Mr. McGovern, Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mrs. Lesko, no. Mrs. Lesko, no. Mr. Chairman, aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. The clerk will report the total. Eight yeas, four nays. The ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. Accordingly, the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Mr. Raskin, will manage for the majority. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, in light of extraordinary stamina and tenacity, and the fact that she clearly has a lot of extra time on her hands, we would have to admit less to the Republicans. Why not? I hear you. What are you uh, feeding her over there? <laughs> I love her. She's great. <laughs> Without objection. <laughs> 
all the committee is adjourned. Thank you all so very much. All right.